So today on Father's Day, how many real men do we have out there? Come on, show of hands, how many real men? Thank you, Bye. Thank you, Joe. How are you determining if you're a real man? How did your macho side come out? Was it as a kid, how hard you could hit a baseball? Or how well you could take a punch? Or was it as a young man? Was it how much booze you could drink? What kind of car you drove, or how much money you made. It seems like men usually judge themselves by these kinds of standards. The best physique. How quick we can come out with a witty, off-the-cuff remark. How many women will wink in our direction. Perhaps you remember that book from the 1980s titled Real Men Don't Eat Quiche, whose author wrote, we've become a nation of wimps, pansies, and quiche eaters. Men who show off their soft side make my stomach churn. The author claimed that real men eat meat and potatoes, not vegetables. That real men drive fast, that real men don't ask for directions, <laughs> that real men hunt big game in the forest and big fish out on the ocean. And most of all, real men don't cry. Well now, confession time. My name is Ken Lobb, and I've shed tears just in the past week. But really, what is a real man? The Bible can sum it up in just one verse for us, in John 11.35. Jesus wept. Two little words. Two little words that pack quite a wallet. You've heard the saying about walking softly and carrying a big stick. Well, this is God's big sin. Jesus wept. It screams volumes. Most of the time when we hear this verse, it's usually associated with the trivia question being, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? And John 11.35 is the correct answer. Jesus wept. Rarely is much more said about it. But do we even know why Jesus cried? We might know it happened during the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. But why did the greatest person to walk the face of the earth feel the need to cry? There are two times recorded in the Bible that Jesus did such a thing. The other being on the evening after Palm Sunday when he stood on a hill and looked out over Jerusalem and cried for the sake of the people. And it's almost the same situation as the one that we're looking at today with Lazarus. Both times, Jesus already knew the outcome of what was going to take place. So this question really becomes vital. Why did our Savior weep? What brought Jesus to tears? Hopefully, on this most manly of days, Father's Day, we're going to learn why we should be thankful that we have a God that will weep for us. Because contrary to the popular mantra, about men, big men, do cry. But let's talk a little bit about this Lazarus story. Jesus and his disciples were out preaching in the outer villages beyond the Jordan River when they received word 
that Lazarus was very sick. And Lazarus just wasn't a casual acquaintance, but someone who, along with his sisters Martha and Mary, that Jesus was very fond of and spent a lot of time together whenever possible. So naturally, one would assume that Jesus would rush right to the bedside of his friend, that he would touch his face or his arms or his hands and heal his friend before he died. Oh, but what limited minds we have. It says in the Gospel that Jesus waited two days before even starting to head back to Ju Judea. That Jesus knew Lazarus was going to be dead before he got to him. Jesus even sent word back to the family that he would be slow in returning back to Lazarus, saying it was for God's glory. Now, I bet that made Mary and Martha confused. So four days after the burial took place, Jesus strolled in with his entourage, and the two sisters took Jesus to task over his tardiness, saying essentially the same thing. Martha in verse 20 and Mary in verse 32, they both said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And ouch, what a sharp question to ask when you're standing in front of the one who you acknowledge as the Lord your God. But throughout our lives, haven't we asked the same thing? How many times have we waited for answers to our prayers just like they did? We often say, why isn't Jesus here when we need him? Why doesn't God hurry up and do something? Where are you, Lord? Hasn't Jesus seemed to disappoint us all at some point? We pray, and no answers come. We're patient, but he doesn't arrive. We plead. But God delays the response. Where are you currently waiting for God to show up? For God to be there for you? And now we don't know exactly the time frame, why Jesus waits, or how the Spirit moves. That's a given. And we know that no amount of theology or explaining can satisfy us when we wait and we go through some kind of sorrow or heartache or despair. But something critically important happens to us while we wait. Because life still moves forward. And while we wait, faith is proved. And while we wait, Hope is tested. Yet we still have that nagging question. Why did this big man, Jesus Christ, the greatest figure in all history, cry? <coughs> Some argue it was because of the, the lack of faith of the people. That he looked deep into the heart of the crowd and realized they didn't understand him or his mission. Or that he was weeping because no one in the crowd believed he was God. Or others say Jesus cried tears of rage at the evil of death and sin. That he was grieving because of the sinfulness of humans. And that the death that follows sin into the world. Or could have Jesus been anticipating his own death? He knew that the miracle he was about to perform was going to inflame the Jewish status quo and turn the Pharisees and their followers against him even more. 
Now, all these are viable options, and no one is wrong to bring them up into the picture. But personally, I have one more reason why Jesus cried. Very simply put, Jesus cried because he cared. He cared for us as individuals and as human beings collectively. He cried for you and for me. He cried for the same reason that we cry at funerals. He grieved with his friends, Martha and Mary. Jesus loved them, and Lazarus too. He grieved that Lazarus died. He identified with their pain and understood their tears. They cry when you cry. When Jesus wept, he was saying to all of us, I know what grief is all about. I know this is not a happy moment. I know death can be awful. And who could ever claim that Jesus was a sissy for doing that? Jesus opens the door for big men to cry, to expose their anguish and their feelings of hurt. It lets men cry to cleanse themselves, to renew and restore, to make new again, to clear the deck with a fresh outlook and a release of tension. There once was a little boy who came home from school late one day, and his mother was worried. And she demanded, why are you so late? And the boy told his mother that today was show and tell day at school, and that his friend Tommy had brought a replica toy of a vintage car that his grandfather had given him. But on the way home, he dropped it, and it broke, and he stayed behind to help his friend. And his mother said, so you helped Tommy fix his toy, huh? And the boy replied, no, Mommy, the car was too broke to fix. I just stayed to help Tommy cry. How Jesus-like that little boy was. He doesn't offer any quick Fix schemes or advice, doesn't try to wipe it away with a funny story or to give his friend a piece of chocolate cake. He simply sits down and helps his friend cry. And isn't that what being a man should really be all about? A man who is there for others, who takes risks without excuse, who shows vulnerability, who knows true suffering and true heartache, and who isn't afraid to face it or show it. As you know, I'm living my life as a one-eyed person. And I wish the trauma would have ended a year ago when the cancerous tumor in my eye was removed and I had a false eye put in, in its place. Yet I'm still in danger. I have to be tested every three months to make sure that none of the cancer cells escape from my eye and eventually find themselves in my liver or lungs. Because if that happens, there's no cure for that. And I have to go to a cancer specialist several times a year to be checked out for this as a follow-up. And that's when the seriousness of my condition hits home. And during my visit this past week on Wednesday, I sat there in the waiting room with another person, a guy whose name was Milton. And he was so friendly and so cheerful. In fact, he was coming from Alabama and had a strong southern accent just to see the same doctor that I was seeing. 
Yet, this person, Milton, hasn't been as fortunate as me. His eye cancer did travel into his liver, and a new tumor developed there and burst. And now he's dealing with that most unpleasant situation named metastasis. And as I spoke to him, my eyes watered up, watered up. Because I'm a person with ocular melanoma myself. And I knew what he was going through. And my heart leaped out to him. Yet he said with a laugh, Boy, you never know what this life of ours is going to throw at you. But I guess I have to face it. And that, my friends, is exactly why Jesus cried. He was helping Martha and Mary to cry. He knew the miracle that was about to take place, that Lazarus would be raised, but even so, he was moved and he was troubled. He had compassion for them in their sorrow. Is Jesus any less of a man for crying? Could any of you look Jesus in the face and tell him that he's not a real man because of what he did? And the things that are hurting us right now at this very moment brings tears to Jesus' eyes. Whatever you're struggling with, God is hurting alongside of us. Jesus is deeply moved in spirit and trouble, just like he was with Mary and Martha. Friends, on this Father's Day, let us be thankful that we have a God that hurts with us, who cries with us, and is not afraid to show it. We serve a living Christ who wasn't afraid to go the distance to the cross, to die there on our behalf, who loves us so much that he would lay down his life for us. Big men do cry.